It is really great to be back here at Roseville High. It's been over 40 years, over 40 years since I last set foot in this school. Obviously a lot has changed, but it still feels like coming home. I've been fortunate in my life to have been recognized by presidents, kings, and prime ministers, but none of those tributes means as much to me as being honored today by my friends who put so much time and effort into seeing that I receive this award. No words can adequately explain what this day means to me. Thank you all so very, very much. I will never forget it. Thank you. When I left Roosevelt High School in 1973, I went to the University of Texas, and after four years, I graduated, joined the Navy, and headed off to SEAL training. As years went by, I got married, raised a family, moved 18 times, chased bad guys around the world, fought in three wars, served with some of the finest men and women I have ever known, and had enough experiences to fill 10 lifetimes. Never once, never once did I regret the path life had chosen for me. But throughout those years, when things got tough, when I needed to dig deep for an answer, when I needed inspiration, when I doubted my future, I always seemed to come back to my time at Roosevelt. High school is a special place where the lessons you learn, the friends you make, the failures you overcome all become part of you. And if you embrace those experiences for the wisdom that they bring, you will be prepared for anything the future throws at you. And the future can be a surprising thing. Your destiny can turn on one act of courage, one act of kindness, or one act of compassion. One of my favorite movies of all time is the Christmas classic, It's a Wonderful Life. It stars one of the great actors of the 1940s and 50s, Jimmy Stewart. Stewart plays a man named George Bailey, who grows up in a small town called Bedford Falls. The movie is set in the 1940s. His whole life, George wants to get out of Bedford Falls and see the world. He wants to do something great with his life. But as time goes on, one thing leads to another, and George is never able to get out of the small town. About halfway through the movie, George falls on hard times and decides he's going to end his life. He goes to a nearby bridge and is preparing to jump off when God sends him an angel, an angel named Clarence. Clarence is new to being an angel, and in order to get his angel wings, he has to convince George Bailey not to jump off the bridge. He must convince George Bailey that his life has been worthwhile. So Clarence decides to so show George what life in Bedford Falls would have been like had he, George Bailey, never been born. There's a great scene in that movie that sometimes goes unnoticed, but it is my favorite scene of all. Clarence takes George to the Bedford Falls graveyard, and there is the headstone of George Bailey's younger brother, Harry. Harry had fallen through the ice when they were young, but George had courageously crawled out on the lake and saved Harry. George looks at the headstone and sees that Harry died when he was just three years old. George looks at Clarence the angel and tells him that that can't be right. Harry not only lived past three, but during World War II, Harry Bailey saved an entire ship from being sunk by a Japanese kamikaze pilot. But Clarence reminds George that because George was never born, he wasn't there to save his younger brother. And then comes the best line in the movie. Clarence says, and because you didn't save Harry, Harry wasn't there to save those 500 men on the ship. And at that point, you realize that the act of one man saved not only his brother's life, but the lives of 500 men on that ship and the children of, of those men and their children's children. You see, that's what high school is all about changing the direction of someone's life. And if you think it's just a movie, let me tell you two more quick stories. When I was a senior here at Roosevelt, I was trained to, trying to break the school record in the mile. I had come close a couple of times, but struggled in the second to the last track meet of the season. The Thursday before my last track meet, my, my last track meet, I received a call from Coach Jerry Turnbow. He was a former Roosevelt football coach who had left the school 18 months earlier for another coaching job in San Antonio. I was stunned that the coach even knew who I was, much less took the time to call. During the phone call, he said, Bill, I know you can break this record. All you have to do is run your hardest. 
You have worked incredibly hard, just do your best and it will be good enough. You will break the record. The next evening, I broke the school record. It was a record no one cared about but me. But breaking that record gave me the confidence that I could do anything I set my mind to. Four years later, I knew I could be a Navy SEAL because Coach Turnbow convinced me that if I set my goals and I worked hard enough, I could do anything. Fifteen years later, I was now the commanding officer of SEAL Team 3. I was at home on leave in San Antonio, and my father, who was a very outgoing fellow, bumped into a guy at the barber shop whose son was in high school and was thinking about going into the SEALs. My dad asked if I would call the young man and give him some advice. I remembered from years before how kind Coach Turnbow had been to call me, so I called the guy and we talked for over 45 minutes. But after the phone call, I never heard from him again. Fifteen years after that, I was in Afghanistan and we were conducting a hostage rescue mission. An elderly American contractor had been abducted by the Taliban and they were threatening to kill him if we didn't meet their demands. Fortunately, we were able to identify the location of the hostage taker's hideout. I sent in the SEALs to rescue the man. It was a small cave complex high in the mountains. It was a very difficult mission, but my most elite SEAL unit climbed the mountain, quietly entered the camp, dispatched the bad guys, and rescued the American. The next morning, the commander of the SEAL unit came by my headquarters and brought with him the SEAL that had led the raid and rescued the American. As we made the introductions, both men had a funny look on their face. Finally, the leader of the SEAL rescue team said, Sir, you probably don't remember me, but 15 years ago you called me and encouraged me to be a SEAL. As I later learned, the SEAL I had called was a decorated war hero who had saved countless lives in the course of his career. I thought how fortunate I was to have been a small part of his success. And then I began to ask myself, where would I be in life were it not for all those who had helped me and inspired me along the way? Where would I be without the friendship of John Scarpula, Mike Morris, Steve Raby, Mark Ware, Morgan King, Keith Geiger, Wilbur Morgan, Skip Hildebrand, and Dave Malott, friends that shaped my life in so very many ways? Where would I be if my first real girlfriend, Cindy Meyer, hadn't thought that I was someone special? Where would I be if the popular kids, like Mike Dippo, Mark Anisiak, Mike Sears, Sylvester Brown, Pat Kennedy, Mary Spire, Missy Remmert, Julie McElhaney, and Becky Phillips hadn't been kind to me and given me the confidence to walk in different circles in life? How would I have found my love for writing if not for Miss Varian, my English teacher, who taught me the passion of the written word? And how would I have gotten through SEAL training without coaches like Wynn Baggett, Buddy Compton, Jim Sagabill and Jerry Turnbow teaching me discipline and hard work and persistence and the will to win. You see, any success I have had in life is a result of all those people who affected my destiny through their kindness, their compassion, their friendship, and their support. Everyone who had an impact on my life subsequently affected the lives of thousands of soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines that I commanded throughout my career. Every success from the capture of Saddam Hussein, to the rescue of Captain Phillips, to the death of, of Osama bin Laden, to the countless lives saved by the men I led, in some way belongs to my friends, my teachers, and my coaches. At no other time in your life will you be so closely associated with the same people. Not college, not business, not even in the military, affords you an opportunity to be around so many of the same people every day for four years straight. And in those days, you will have a thousand opportunities to help someone in need, to befriend an awkward student, to turn a moment of failure into a moment of success, to teach, to instruct, to discipline, to give hope. In those days, you will have an opportunity to change someone's life forever. And by doing so, change a thousand other lives you'll never know. For you students in the audience, you look up here, and you see an old man standing at the podium. You can't even imagine how old 60 must be. <laughs> but before you know it, you will be 20, and then 30, and then 40, 50, and 60. And the men and women you hope to be will be forged right here in high school. But equally important, the men and women 
who will go on to raise wonderful families, find cures for cancer, fight our fires, protect our citizens, care for the homeless, and join the military are your fellow students sitting right beside you. Never, ever pass up a chance to help someone. Never, ever pass up the chance to be kind. The students you help could go on to change the world, and you can be part of it. Thank you all once again for this tremendous honor. Nothing in my life compares to it. Thank you.